welcome to Classical Mechanics 2. In this video, we'll explore the moment of inertia tensor, symmetries, and principal axes. But first off, what's a tensor? I love this illustration by Carl Stratos, who's a professor at Rutgers specializing in natural language processing. Tensors are objects in linear algebra, just like vectors and matrices. It helps to think about what type of data we have and how we choose to represent them. If our data is one-dimensional, we express it using a single number. This is a scalar. When we have n-dimensional data, we represent these as a list of numbers, which we call a vector. One thing you'll often see in tensor algebra and calculus is index notation. vi is the ith component of the vector v, where v has components ranging from v1, v2, etc. through vn. Many linear algebra notions are simplified using what's called the Einstein summation convention. In this convention, repeated indices are summed over. For instance, q dot r can be written as the sum on i of q i times r i, or in Einstein notation, this is simply written as q i times r i, where the summation is implicit. You'll often see this as raised and lowered indices in other subjects, such as general relativity, where you need to pay attention to covariant and contravariant vectors. This is like thinking of the dot product as the result of multiplying a row vector by a column vector. So in this version of the summation convention, only pairs of repeated indices with one raised index and one lowered index are summed over. In Euclidean space, these dual spaces are isomorphic, so we can ignore the raising and lowering operations. Matrices and tensors are ways of representing multilinear data. These are given by arrays of numbers. A matrix is the simplest form of a tensor. We can see this in the Eigen system equation, mv equals lambda v. We can write this in summation notation as mij times vj is equal to lambda times vi. So the ijth component of the matrix M is multiplied by the jth component of the vector V, and this is equal to the scalar lambda times the ith component of the vector V. The number of i's and j's in the system depends on the overall dimensionality of the system, not on the number of dimensions of the array. Many tensors aren't represented by two-dimensional arrays. The rank of a tensor is the number of indices it has. From this point of view, a scalar is a rank zero tensor, a vector is a rank one tensor, a matrix is a rank two tensor, since it has ij. The first tensor of rank greater than two you're likely to encounter comes in the definition of the cross product. So let's consider the cross product s is equal to q cross r. The ith component of s is equal to epsilon ijk times qj times rk where epsilon is the totally anti-symmetric tensor that is equal to 1 when ijk is an even permutation of 1, 2, 3, and minus 1 when ijk is an odd permutation of 1, 2, 3, and 0 in all other cases. In my research, we end up dealing with the rank 4 elastic constant tensor. This is cijkl. General relativity has a rank for Ricci curvature tensor. However, in this video, we'll be primarily dealing with a rank two tensor, and that is the moment of inertia tensor, Iij. Here we have an object that's rotating through an axis that's anchored to the origin of our lab frame. It has infinitesimal mass element dm located a distance r from the origin. It has angular momentum dl is equal to the radius r cross the momentum of the mass element, where the momentum of the mass element is given by its velocity times its infinitesimal mass, which is given by omega cross r. Then the total angular momentum in our system is the integral of r cross the infinitesimal momentum, which is omega cross r times dm. What we're going to do is expand out these cross products to derive the form of the moment of inertia tensor. First, let's look at the term omega cross r. We can calculate the cross products using the determinant of a matrix consisting of the unit vectors in the Cartesian basis, the components of the first vector, and lastly, the components of the second vector. 
And this gives us omega y times z minus omega z times y in the x hat direction plus omega z times x minus omega x times z in the y direction plus omega x times y minus omega y times x in the z direction. But for now, we're going to write this as components of the velocity of our mass element for space reasons. Now that we know what omega cross r is as a vector, we can calculate the full vector of r cross omega cross r. So this is given by the determinant of a matrix composed of the unit vectors, the components of the r vector, and the components of the v vector. This gives us omega x times y squared plus z squared minus omega y times xy plus omega z times xz in the x direction plus omega y times x squared plus z squared minus omega x times xy plus omega z times yz in the y direction plus omega z times x squared plus y squared minus omega x times xz plus omega y times yz in the z hat direction. But we also know that the total angular momentum is given by i, so our moment of inertia tensor, times the vector omega. So let's collect the components that contain first omega x. These are omega x times y squared plus z squared in the x hat direction minus omega x times x y in the y hat direction and minus omega x times x z in the z hat direction. And likewise, we can collect all of the components that are multiplied by omega y and omega z. And when we factor out the omega x's, omega y's, and omega z's, we're left with a rank 2 tensor that has all of the components of our moments of inertia. Thus, our full moment of inertia tensor is given by the integral of y squared plus z squared dm minus the integral of xy dm minus the integral of xz dm minus the integral of y x dm, the integral of x squared plus z squared dm, minus the integral of y z dm, minus the integral of z x dm, minus the integral of z y dm, the integral of x squared plus y squared dm. This is a lot of algebra all at once, but let's decompose the components and see what's going on. First, we'll look at the diagonal components. So each of these has a component that measures the distance squared of the infinitesimal mass element from each of the Cartesian axes. So the xx term here integrates the distance to the x-axis of our infinitesimal mass element in the yz plane, and its distance is y squared plus z squared. The yy component measures the distance to the y-axis, so that's this distance here, and this is measured in the xz plane. And lastly, the zz component measures the distance from the mass element to the z-axis, and that's measured in the xy plane. The off-diagonal terms measure the distance from the infinitesimal mass element to the lines x equals y x equals z and y equals z. Notice that since x equals y implies also that y is equal to x, the moment of inertia tensor is symmetric. Now that we know the moment of inertia tensor for this body rotating about an arbitrary axis anchored at the origin, what is the kinetic energy of this body? We'll start with the kinetic energy of the infinitesimal mass element dm. This element has kinetic energy given by 1 half dm times its velocity squared. This is 1 half times dm times the magnitude of the vector omega cross r squared. Then the total energy is obtained by integrating this infinitesimal kinetic energy across the whole body. From the components of the vector omega cross r, this is going to be given by one half the integral on dm of omega y times z minus omega z times y quantity squared plus omega x times z minus omega z times x quantity squared 
plus omega x times y minus omega y times x quantity squared. And if we do the same term-wise analysis we just did, this shows that the kinetic energy is equal to one half the rho vector omega x omega y omega z times the moment of inertia tensor i times the column vector omega x times omega y times omega z. And we can write this as one half omega transpose. So this takes the omega, which we normally write as a column vector and turns it into a row vector times the moment of inertia tensor times the regular column vector version of our angular velocity. Or equivalently, this is written as one half the angular velocity vector dotted into the angular momentum, which is i times omega. What if our object is both translating and rotating? Imagine now that our object is translating at some velocity vcm while rotating about some axis omega, which is no longer anchored to the origin. Then the center of mass is located at rcm and the distance from the center of mass to an infinitesimal mass element we're going to call r prime. Our definition v equals omega cross r doesn't hold anymore. That was only valid for rotations where the axis of rotation is anchored at the origin. So let's rearrange our system so we can take advantage of this particular convenient substitution. From Chazel's theorem, we know that all motion can be decomposed as the sum of a translational velocity and a rotational velocity. So here the translational velocity is vcm and the rotational velocity is v prime. Since the axis of rotation passes through RCM, we can now use that in the simplification. So we find that V prime is equal to omega cross R prime, where R prime is this distance here. Since the axis of rotation is passing through RCM, we can now use the simplification that V prime is equal to omega cross R prime. So the velocity of our mass element is now given by vcm plus omega cross r prime. This definition lets us extend the total angular momentum, or the integral of r cross v times dm, as the integral of rcm plus r prime cross vcm plus omega cross r prime, and we're integrating that over dm. When we group terms, we get RCM cross VCM times the total mass plus the integral of R prime cross omega cross R prime integrated over dm. This term here is the angular momentum that we just derived for our object rotating about an arbitrary axis that's fixed to the origin. So again, we discover the familiar decomposition that the angular momentum can be written as an orbital component plus a spin component. Likewise, the kinetic energy, which is one half times the integral of v squared dm, is now equal to one half vcm plus omega cross r quantity squared dm. And again, we can break this into two components. So the first is one half m times vcm squared, and the other is one half omega dotted into the angular momentum about the center of mass. Therefore, the kinetic energy is also the sum of a translational component and a rotational component. When we're actually solving problems, we don't want to have to worry about keeping the axis of rotation passing either through the origin or its center of mass. Doing integrals for the moment of inertia tensor in these coordinates is messy, and if the axis of rotation changes, the algebra can get even worse. So instead, what we do is construct a coordinate system that's based on the body of the object we're studying. To do this, we're going to change our basis so that the moment of inertia tensor is diagonal. So in this new basis, our moment of inertia tensor looks really nice. It just has components I11, I22, and I33 all down the diagonal. These are known as the principal moments. They're also the eigenvalues of the moment of inertia tensor. The new basis is given by the unit vectors omega hat, which are called the principal axes. And these are the eigenvectors of the moment of inertia tensor. 
In this new coordinate system that's stuck to the body of the object, the angular momentum is given by I11 times omega 1, I22 times omega 2, and I33 times omega 3. Likewise, the kinetic energy is also quite simple. It's given by 1 half I11 times omega 1 squared plus I22 times omega 2 squared plus I33 times omega 3 squared. There are some cases where this can be even further simplified. Usually this means that there's a symmetry of the system that we can take advantage of. That means that there's some degenerate subspace in this moment of inertia tensor. For instance, if two moments are the same, then any axis passing through the origin in the plane of those two principal axes is also a principal axis. An example of this is this yield sign, which has in-plane rotational symmetry that isn't 180 degrees. Then any axis in this xy plane can be considered a principal axis, and all of them will have the same moment. In the next video, we'll use this new coordinate system based on the moment of inertia tensor to investigate the physics of rotating rigid bodies. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.